Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody watching uh, here in Zoom and on YouTube as well. Uh, welcome to the Spotlight Mining e-conference this Thursday, the 30th of April. Uh, we've got a packed schedule today. Very, very happy to be joined by Martin French, Claudia Tornquist, John Black, Andrew O'Donnell and Cole Evans. And we're going to hear uh, four presentations and a brief keynote from Andrew and then jump into our Q&A. Um, i got to start with a quick I say quick every week and it takes me 10 minutes to share the screen, but uh, there we go. So please be aware that nothing presented today or discussed in our chat room uh, should be considered as financial advice or a buy or sell recommendation for any of the companies involved. We urge you to seek professional guidance before making any investments. Investments can go up and down dramatically. Only gamble with what you can afford to lose. Uh, play safe out there. So without further ado, we're going to hand over to Andrew O'Donnell from Supercharged Stocks, who's going to give us a keynote on the state of the copper industry today. Cheers, Andrew. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, just pleased to be here. Thank you, Liam from Spotlight Mining and his whole crew, this ever-growing platform, uh, doing a great job. So I'm really excited to be talking about copper because copper is a foundational uh, metal the future. And when I talk about that, it's that kind of key phrase, the electrification of the future. What I intend to do is just give a real high macro overview of, of where we're looking at in the state of, of copper and then get to the, the good stuff, which is the companies presenting because there's a lot of opportunity out there. So as everyone knows, what we're the, the big news is the electric vehicle or the battery storage uh, stories that come out of this. Uh, and that's what everyone is keen on, whether it's Tesla or it's uh, Mercedes or it's Volkswagen. All of these companies are pushing and moving towards uh, a greener, cleaner um, uh, you know, vehicle movement. And regardless of you know, copper having a bit of a slump this quarter for obvious reasons, uh, the long-term demand for copper is going to be exceptional because it really is the foundation, that cornerstone that brings everything together. And uh, having good projects in solid regions is going to be key. So without even just touching on the enormity of, of thinking of transforming uh, cars uh, or buses or you know, uh, snowmobiles, anything that's going to be moving into more electric. Uh, it takes the next step towards power grids. Imagine the, the overhaul that needs to be done just in North America alone uh, in order to, to get uh, the power grid system to then develop a lot of these smart cities that we see in, in China and Asia. Uh, if we're going towards that, which inevitably we are, uh, there needs to be so much infrastructure, so much copper in particular that's going to be required uh, that it is, uh, it's actually a little bit shocking. Um, infrastructure on its own is actually, as, as boring as it may sound, is actually a huge market that is funded a lot by private equity and family office funds. Uh, mo most people think it's just government, but it isn't anymore. There's a lot more private equity money going into huge, from start to end, process that whole chain uh, of family office because they need to deploy significant capital and they want to make money along the way over long-term projects. Now McKinsey, uh, they had put out a report, uh, I think they were suggesting about 3.3 trillion a year is required to meet the pace of what world growth is expected. Now I think that's very, uh, very liberal to say the least. I think that's very, very hot. Uh, because I don't think we're going to see the same type of growth across the world that uh, they, they, they think that it's going to be. There's certainly going to be massive increase. So even with going to this COVID future, I don't believe, I 100% believe, don't believe that China is going to stop their growth. They're just not. Uh, I, anyone can argue with me, but I, I don't think they are. We might see more of a slowdown in the West uh, because there's a lot more political games to be played. Um, but Hopefully we don't, because we need to see this transformation. And it is a race, uh, make no mistake. It is a race towards getting these cities, getting this future to what we want. And you know, now that we've deployed a ton of capital in the West, hopefully we'll deploy it in the right way. Um, the other one I want to touch on, because it's really it's, it's a very high level macro kind of idea, and it's poignant, is this kind of co uh, COVID future. Um, and copper plays a role there as well. So. Uh, we've seen articles in the past uh, you know, three or four years as well leading up to this about the antimicrobial uh, feature uh, that copper pr uh, presents. And is actually in one of the, uh, in one issue of uh, infection control and epistemology or epidemiology, um, 
we know that there's stainless steel being used in hospitals, but if you can replace that with copper antimicrobial, uh, uh, they can see health associated infections decreasing by about 58%, which is, which is enormous. Uh, now you can imagine pulling all the steel out of every hospital uh, across the world. It would be an enormous venture on its own. But things like this have to become uh, poignant questions because of the medical face that we're, we're faced with with this crisis. So we see this broad use, whether it's from health and medicine and wellness uh, to electrification of the future, all this copper plays a main role, plays that foundation. And I think uh, often, I mean, I've joked, I wrote in an article calling it, uh, it's, it's, not a, a, it's not a bronze or a third place material. It is key, it's the foundation. So enough about me, I, I, uh, I like the, the space for obvious reasons. I think long-term, uh, I'm a long-term thinker. You know, we've had a bit, a bit of a bounce back in the last few days with copper, but I see long-term support for copper and I'm really excited to hear from these companies. So thank you for letting me share and ever enjoy the conference. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks for joining us. And you're going to stick around and join the panel later on, right? Yes. Great. We look forward to hearing uh, hearing some of your tougher questions for, for these companies that have joined us today. <laughs> so we're going to start today's presentations now with uh, John Black from Regulus Resources. John, can you hear me there? Sorry, that I think you're muted. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, I can, Liam. Great stuff, yeah. Take it away, John, if you want to introduce yourself, the company, and uh, yeah. And should I go ahead and share a screen now? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, okay. Did I get that done correctly? Okay, great. Well, Liam, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us to this. And, and thank you to Laura Brangwin, who's our, our manager for IR, who helped set this up. Um, my name's John Black. I'm an exploration geologist by background. I spent about the first half of my career working for major mining companies. And the second half of my career has been running junior companies, finding large copper deposits that we deliver to the majors because they're, they're no longer as efficient at making their own discoveries as they, they used to be. In the brief time we have right now, I'd like to just present Regulus Resources and our Anticori Copper Gold Project, a really exciting copper gold discovery in Northern Peru. And, and thank you very much to Andrew for setting the stage for, for why we should be looking for these type of projects as we move forward. We are a publicly listed company. We're listed both on the Venture Exchange in Toronto, as well as on the Peruvian Exchange based out of Lima. So the appropriate disclaimers apply. And we don't really need to go into this, Liam, or Andrew's already set the stage on, on why we should be looking for copper deposits. Um, our view is, is that the, the case for this is even strengthened now, perhaps pushed out a little bit in the future on this, but uh, we're seeing mines already shut down. A lot of the marginal copper mines have been shut down in the last uh, few weeks, literally on this, and we'll, we'll see an increasing pressure put on, on lack, of lack of supply to, to meet this increasing demand. The project we have in, in Anticori in Northern Peru is one of the larger copper projects that's in the hands of junior companies. It's important that I emphasize in the hands of junior companies because we're, when we make discoveries as junior companies, we're, likely the company, we're not likely the company that will produce or put it into production. We're, we're likely to be acquired by a major mining company. That's our intentional strategy as a junior. And these projects, there are very few of them out there to be developed. And there are very few of them that are available for acquisition. So as we see the anticipated increase in copper price as that gap opens up, the major companies will be looking to acquire projects and those of us that have made discoveries are in an excellent position to deliver those projects. So let's jump right into the Antiquary project. It's a, a very large copper gold discovery already. Uh, we're continuing to advance the size of it. We're located in Northern Peru, which is a great place to have a project. Peru is a major mining country. It's the second largest copper producer in the world. And we're in the very northern part of the country in a section of the, of, the, of the Peruvian Andes that's extremely well endowed with major copper and gold deposits. On the diagram on the left, we can see our Anticori project. Uh, we're not far from Yanacocha, which is the largest gold mine in South America. We have other large gold mines and, and large uh, porphyry copper or copper gold deposits in the immediate area. On the right side of the diagram, we can see 
that the project's located about two and a half hours north of the city of Cajamarca, a fairly ma major city with good infrastructure and, and good uh, workforce available there. It's uh, as we drive to the project, it's a paved road all the way to the project, largely because we passed the Anacocha mine halfway out. That's Newmont and one of Tours large gold project, uh, soon to transition to copper gold. And we're immediately adjacent to two operating mines, the Tantawa Tai mine, which is operated by a joint venture between Southern Peru Copper, which is um, Grupo Mexico's uh, Peruvian sub operating major mines in the south of Peru and one of Ventura, which is, is a large uh, precious and base metals Peruvian mining company. And then seven kilometers away, we have Cerro Corona, which is a, a copper gold porphyry operated by gold fields. On the next slide, we can see when I say that we're immediately adjacent to two operating mines, you can see from the image just how close we really are. Um, our land position is we own 100% of the red claims on this diagram, and we have an option to earn in up to 70% of the pink block. Uh, between these two agreements, we form a consolidated block on the north side of the Tantuatai mine. And then we can see the Cerro Corona mine seven kilometers to the southeast. The Tantuatai mine is a, a heap leach oxide gold mine. What they're doing is they're mining the oxidized cap over a very large copper gold sulfide deposit at depth. That copper gold sulfide deposit at depth that they have extends onto our ground. So we have a, a very significant, what we would argue is a key portion of this large copper gold sulfide deposit. And we'll talk in a moment just how, how big the sulfide deposit is as we see it right now. The oxides run out, uh, the mine runs out of oxide ore in five years, in 2025. And they're already beginning to lay the, the ground groundwork or the foundation to make that transition from a heap leach oxide mine to a much larger copper gold sulfide mine at depth. So in many ways, we'll see that we, we're on to a new discovery. Uh, the, the, even the sulfide portion of the neighbors isn't that well known in, in the industry, but um, it's, it's essentially a brownfield situation because we have a mine that will run out of ore that's a logical brownfields extension or expansion to, to develop the, the mineralization that we're defining. Likewise, at Cerro Corona, seven kilometers to the southeast, both of these are very good mines for their owners, but they have short mine life. Cerro Corona also runs out of tailing space in 2025, and they don't have enough ore to justify a new tailing space. So they will stop mining, backfill their pit with tailings, and run off, off of uh, run of mine ore to 2030. So effectively, in the next five to 10 years, both of these good mines run out of ore, but we're collectively sitting on a very large copper gold sulfide deposit. This diagram shows uh, much of what we just described on that transition, that that key point is 2025. We like having that because many times when we make these discoveries, they sit and they take a long time for people to, to visualize how this will become a mine. Here we have some very immediate pressure on the, on the mine operators in the area. And quite frankly, an excellent opportunity collectively to make a transition from two medium-sized, quite profitable mines into one very large copper mine providing uh, stability of employment in the area and continuity of uh, financial benefits for all the stakeholders in the area. What have we achieved at Anticori? We've been drilling for a little over two years on the project. Uh, we, when we inherited the project, it had 17,000 meters of drilling. We completed our phase one program, which was 23,000 meters. And about one year ago at this time, we announced our first interim resource. We emphasize interim because this is just the first look. This project's still very much open. But uh, we have 250 million tons of indicated and 267 million tons for combined over 500 million tons of quite attractive copper gold grades. The copper equivalent grades are about 0.7 on this deposit. To put that into perspective, just in gold alone in the project, we have four and a half million ounces of contained gold in the project. And we have about 5 billion pounds of contained copper. So the resource we've put out is already quite sizable, quite interesting. The neighbors next door have last publicly reported about 900 million tons at similar grades. So the, the, the combined project is exceeding, exceeding a billion, approaching a billion and a half tons of, of defined mineralization and very much open for expansion on both the neighbor's property and our property. Important to note that the mineralization, uh, there's, there's a lot of it, it has very good grade, but it also has some arsenic challenges in about half of the ore. Um, the, the elevated arsenic is a, a metallurgical challenge on this, but we're seeing this happen in many copper oxide or copper sulfide 
concentrates around the world of seeing that arsenic content increase. And increasingly, companies are developing manners in which they can confront this. We particularly like to point out the gold groups are quite comfortable with pressure oxidation for this, this style of mineralization. Um, to put the, the project in perspective, we're often treated as a, as a copper company, and we'll see that copper companies tend to, to uh, perhaps be lagging behind the gold companies that are catching a lot of the interest right now. But this diagram just shows the, the percentage of the copper. When we calculated the resource, we always thought we were about two-thirds copper and one-third precious metals. If we use cur today's current prices, the contained metals are approaching 50% for the precious metals component of the project. On this diagram, we can see a little more closely the, the actual situation on it. In the right-hand side, we see our land position in red, that we own 100% pink, we can earn 70%. The neighbor's ground on the mine next door is in the two shades of gray. And the, the resource that we report is constrained by the pit, which is the black circular outline, but we only report the resource that's on the red claims within that pit. So that over 500 million tons of resource comes from the red claims only. You can imagine how much mineralization must be on the neighbors. We're allowed with our agreements to use their data to constrain our pit, but we can't report what's on their side. What we can say is that the overall strip ratio of the combined operation is less than one to one at 0 0.85 to one. And uh, that's actually a little bit high because we, we don't have data in some of their area and we have to treat it as waste. The section shows how we have to report this. So the section is looking north on the white line and we can see we can only report the mineralization on our ground. We, we see ourselves, but we can't report what's on the neighbor's ground for, for obvious reasons. And so on a section like this, you'll see the not on regulus ground portion, but you can imagine mineralization much, must extend there. And this section is a good one to note that early on, there's very high, in addition to low strip, there's very high grade mineralization near surface. So that's, that's a very important aspect of this project that in addition to a large amount of tonnage, um, quite elevated grades, we have very low strip. All of those positive features are slightly offset by the additional capital to handle the arsenic, but it's a, it's a good situation. As I said, we've been drilling for a couple of years. Over the last two years, these are the best copper intercepts reported from publicly traded junior companies. Um, and they're ordered by a copper equivalent. So it's the length of the copper intercept by the grade of the copper intercept. To be on this diagram, you need to have very long runs of very good grade of mineralization. We have five of the top 20 holes reported publicly in this period of time. The only group that's consistently delivering better results than us in this period of time in the junior public space is the Cascavel project of Soul Gold. Um, but it's important to note that many of their intercepts start quite deep, whereas many of our intercepts start close to the surface. Um, I've laid out the case that we have a very nice resource in hand, but what we're really excited is about the potential to go to the north. On this diagram, we can see um, a very uh, exciting geophysical pattern as, as geologists. And this is magnetic information. And when we see a circular magnetic low represented by the cool area, surrounded by an annular magnetic high ring in the hotter colors, that's a classic signature of a porphyry intrusive center with developing scarn or horn fells around the outer margins. Our permitting to date has only allowed us to drill the southwest quadrant of that magnetic high. And we've, we've found some quite exciting results, both in the high sulfidation epithermal mineralization that overlies with arsenic and the cleaner scar mineralization at depth. Um, we've just received our permits at the very end of last year to be able to step to the north and drill these targets to the north. We view these have potential to substantially increase the size of the resource, which is already quite large. And in, more importantly, probably um, produce cleaner mineralization that's metallurgically uh, easier to process, lower cost to process on this. Some of the, the intercepts that we've in, uh, reported reaching out to the north from where we've been able to drill are shown in the lower right hand side of the diagram. These are the ones that, that make a list like that. So our current plan is to um, continue that drilling as soon as we can get back to work. We have the permits in hand. So um, at, at the point that we can safely work both legally and with respect to the communities in the areas that we're working, everybody's comfortable that we're back to work, we will begin to step into those untested targets to the north. Slide 14 just shows a quick look at the return. Um, this is our actually the second company of three in the same management team. Um, we Our first um, junior company that we set up, we managed to make a major discovery in Southern Peru, which we drilled out and sold the first quantum, resulting in a very handsome return for our shareholders. 
we're back on to another one now. So the, we've got a very experienced team. We've done it before. We're on a great project and we think we're well set up to do it again. And about the amount of time it takes for us to fully reveal the potential of this is about the time we think we'll be back into that supply gap. So uh, there's some additional information on, on share counts and stuff for those of you who want to take a look at it. And please uh, check out our website or contact Laura or myself if you'd like additional information on the company. Thank you. Thank you very much there, John. I should point out that uh, on the screen, it does say that your name is Laura Brangwin. Uh, that's entirely my mistake. Uh, John Black is who you were just listening to. So thank you very much. To summarize uh, Regulus from what I heard there, realistic mining story in a decent jurisdiction, existing production in the area. Uh, you've got a good selection of grades and a history of selling to majors. And those are all, all positive points. Uh, to summarize very, very briefly. <laughs> so to everybody watching, uh, thank you for joining again. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, you can actually, if you want to tweet us any questions you've got for the presenters, I am online at the moment as well. So we'll be happy to put those forwards that way. Next, we're going to hear from Claudia Tornquist from Kodiak Copper. How are you there, Claudia? I'm very well. Thanks for having me, Liam. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks for putting this webinar together. You're very welcome. Yeah. I'll be sharing if you'd like to... my screen now. Yeah, go ahead. Here we go. So I'll be talking about Kodiak Copper and give you a very quick overview of what we are about. And we're making forward looking statements. Please keep this in mind and do your own due diligence and use your own judgment. And I'll start with a quick elevator pitch of what Kodiak is about. We are Founded, or our founder and chairman is Chris Taylor, who many of you know from a company called Great Bear, which was one of the big exploration successes in the last two years in Canada. Well, globally, they made a very major gold discovery. And Chris is a very smart geologist, very much of an out of box, out of the box thinker. And he is uh, our chairman and very, very much involved on the technical side in Kodiak's um, work. And Chris often gets asked, what's your next deal? And that's really what Kodiak is about. We have a very similar strategy to Great Bear. We are focused on assets, on projects that um, have been previously explored, that have partly been drilled by, for many years by many companies, but haven't been figured out. That's what Great Bear did very successfully with their Dixie project. And that's what um, we are doing in the copper space. We did um, our first drill program last year in November and were successful right away and proved our strategy. We were able to announce a discovery this year, earlier this year, on our MPD copper gold project in Southern British Columbia. So we had a great start to the year. We are fully funded. We were able to close a private placement on the back of, of our recent discovery. And that puts us of course now into, in a very strong position in this very difficult market at the moment. I'm very grateful to our investors that they stood by us. And that means now we have fully funded for our summer of exploration and have an exciting drill program ahead of us. We will be back on the ground at MPD in only a couple of weeks time in June. We're actually already doing the geophysics and starting all the preparatory work. And it should be a very exciting drill program following up on our discovery. And I'll talk about this more in a short while. Keep in mind, MPD, our main project is not our only project. We have two other large copper porphyries, one in Arizona, one in the Golden Triangle. So we're not a one show pony. Both of these other projects are also interesting in their own rights and have equally as much discovery potential as MPD does. And last but not least, I should highlight that Kodiak is a member of a group of companies called the Discovery Group that's been put together by John Robbins, who is a very well respected mining entrepreneur in Canada and has many successes to his name. Uh, his biggest was 
Kaminak, a company he founded and then sold to Gold Cup for over half a billion dollars. So he's really a great um, mentor, great shareholder advisor to our company. And for us, being part of the discovery group means um, great access to people, technical expertise, capital. And we are a much stronger company than we would be just on our own. So very much appreciate being part of, of discovery. A couple of words about our MPD project, the project where we announced the discovery in January. This map shows where it is located. You see at the bottom corner of the map, a map of British Columbia, we are right in the south, very close to Vancouver, three hours on the highway down the road, so very, very accessible. And um, we are in the midst of a producing copper belt. There are two of Canada's largest copper mines, Copper Mountain and Highland Valley, just kilometers away, and also lots and lots of other former producing mines, exploration projects. So it is a very established mining area, which of course makes it, makes it that much easier because we have all the services, everything you need for an exploration project right at our fingertips. So great location. What I'd also like to highlight is we have a nice big land package. And this land package um, has been consolidated from three smaller projects that all have been explored partly for 50 years, but nobody in recent times has had the chance to look at the entire consolidated package. And that of course is the first step for us to create value here. This is a zoom in on the claims and the key point to take away is again the accessibility. We have two highways here, 97C at the, at the top and here in the corner, the highway 5A. Both are a kilometer or so away. We have a transmission line, we have water, we have lots of lots of logging roads on the property. Our drill contractor literally came from a town a couple of, of kilometers down the road, packed his drill rig onto the back of the truck and drove right up to the um, drill pad. And that, of course, for us makes our exploration dollars go a long way. It's a lot more cost effective to explore this project than a project that's more remote. And also further down the road to make MPD economic, the hurdle we have to cross or make or the grades we have to have are so much lower than a similar project would have in a more remote location. So location and accessibility is a key why we like this project. And particularly now with all the COVID restrictions, travel restrictions, it's also a big advantage. We have a local workforce. We can more or less drill and work this project as normal. We are not locked down. And that's of course also great in this current time. These are a couple of the historic drill results. I won't bore you with the details, but the key takeaway here is all of those drill results, 129 holes, they are almost all very shallow. As you typically would have done 20 years, 30 years, 40 years ago, when you explored for porphyries, you would drill down 100 meters, maybe 200 meters. And that's what almost all of these results are about. And when Chris Taylor looked at this project, when we acquired it, he saw one deeper hole that one previous company had, had drilled and had some interesting results. And his take on this was, we have to drill deeper. It hasn't been drilled deep enough. They've just scratched the surface and it's really at, at greater depth where the real interesting stuff is. So that's what we tried for our um, exploration project. And here is what we found. That was our first drill program small initial drill program. And here on the left, you see our discovery hole. It's by far and away the best hole ever drilled on the property. It was down to 800 meters, mineralized top to bottom. It ended in mineralization. And you see here on the right, the overall intercept, 763 meters of 0.28% copper equivalent. And very importantly, within this very long mineralized intercept, there were also much higher grade sections. For example, here on the left, 102 meters of 0.68% copper equivalent, or 210 meters of 0.52% copper equivalent. 
And that's, of course, very encouraging. Now, keep in mind the grades that we see in the area, they are just about um, around the 0.2, 0 0.3% copper um, uh, mark. Often people say, well, in South America, there are much higher grades. In British Columbia, typically, um, 0.23 is, for example, our neighbor Copper Mountains. 0.3 Copper is our neighbor um, Highland Valley. These are very typical grades. Mines in North America are lower grade because they are very cheap and easy to mine. And so those grades work out very well. And for us, obviously, to find these higher grade, grade sections, um, that's a very encouraging sign because here we are looking at twice the grade of what the neighboring mines mine. So we're very pleased with that initial success. And that obviously kicked the door wide open. You see here a map of the property. In total, these are 10 square kilometers. And you see the geophysical anomalies and all these black dots are the historic holes. All of those very shallow. We have now drilled in this small corner here to the left. That's where our gate zone discovery is. And we've got our work cut out now. We are in the process of defining the best targets here in this large 10 square kilometer area for our next drill program, which will start in a couple of weeks time in June. So it's a very exciting time for our company. I think we have a very good um, kick at the can, a very good chance to generate some more exciting results. Um, to end up with just our capital structure, we are at the moment 10 million market cap company. Our share price has been decimated just like most everybody else's in the COVID crisis over the last couple of weeks. We've just been nudging upwards towards um, 30 cents again from a low of 20. If you look at our insider buying, uh, you will see that lots of our insiders have been buying. We see, of course, this as a buying opportunity because we have some very near-term catalysts coming up and a very exciting drill program. And just to recap, in a nutshell, what Kodiak's about. So Chris Taylor is at the, at the helm leading the technical work. He's a rock star geologist. He's a big part of our success. We are following in the footsteps of a Great Bear's successful strategy. We're very much doing what they are doing, but in the copper space. We had a great start with our first drill program and a discovery right off the bat. And we will be drilling again in only a couple of weeks time. So there will be a, a near to catalyst coming up and lots of news flow. I'm very excited. I can't wait to get drilling again. And it should be a, a great and very eventful summer. And hopefully we'll be able to create lots of value for our shareholder through discovery. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Very interesting to, to finally hear more about Kodiak. <laughs> I've heard the name thrown around a lot and that's the first time I've heard a presentation. So cheers. A uh, quick question on the spot. What was the last drill intercept you had there? What was the last big hit? In, um, at MPD? Mm. The, um, we only had one drill program and our discovery hole was the 763 meters of 0.28% copper equivalent. This hole right from the surface down to 800 that was mineralized the whole way and had also long sections of 100, 100 to 200 meters of twice that grade. So that was our starting point. That's where we will build on in our next project program, sorry. That was a question from Kane, by the way, just uh, passed along, cheers Kane. So um, yeah. Without further ado, let's move straight on. Um, thank you very much, Claudia. Martin, can you hear us there? I can, yeah. Hi, Liv. Wonderful. How are you doing today, Martin? Yeah, pretty good. And, uh, good. Welcome from the north of England, yeah. From the north of England, my home originally. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'll pass the screen on to you now if you'd like to share and tell us a bit about Chesterfield Resources. Sure. So I'll just uh, get our presentation up. Um, so yeah, hello everybody, um, and thanks for um, <clears throat> tuning in to hear about Chesterfield. Um, okay, there we go. So um, 
what is Chesterfield? We're listed in the UK um, and we <clears throat> did a reverse takeover of some assets in Cyprus um, in 2000, mid 2018. And we do actually, for all uh, the people watching from, Can from Canada, we have a strong Canadian aspect to us. Um, we're founded by a number of prominent Canadian investors um, and also some of our technical team comes from Canada. Um, but the genesis of the, <clears throat> the business was really to look for copper um, and we wanted leverage as investors. So we were looking for um, a kind of some cheap uh, copper exploration licenses um, that we could then explore and, and hopefully monetize and provide leverage for investors. Um, we're looking for VMS deposits uh, in Cyprus, which is a famous old VMS territory, which I'll come on to. We have a, a great team um, and we're pure exploration, but the exploration program is now very advanced. In fact, we just started to drill before this um, <coughs> Copris crisis swept through Europe. Um, so as soon as it's uh, released, we'll get drilling again. So a little bit about Cyprus. Um, an interesting fact you may not know, but the word copper actually comes from the word for Cyprus, the old Latin word cuprum. And in kind of Greek and Roman times, it was a world center for copper. Um, it's on the Tethian belt. Um, and more recently in the 1960s and 1970s, it was a pretty major copper producer. Um, and some of the deposits there were really quite large. Um, in, in, uh, it, it joined the EU in 2004. It's quite an advanced country. Um, it has very strong UK links. Um, the law is based off UK, off English common law, um, and their strong cultural links with the UK. They're big RAF bases on the island, and it's a big listening uh, post for the Middle East. So it is quite a sort of stable and strong jurisdiction for us. Um, and as an old mining jurisdiction, it, it's, um, it, we have very strong support from the government. Um, there isn't a big environmental lobby there. Um, and uh, we think it's a great, a great place for us to go and explore. Uh, when you get to Cyprus, um, you know, people are pretty surprised. It's a small island. Um, but in the mountainous area where we're based, uh, there are big old open pits kind of pretty much everywhere. So it obviously was an extremely active mining area in, in the sort of 60s and 70s. Um, and then what happened in 1974, uh, the island was invaded by uh, Turkey. It had a kind of uh, a mixture of a Christian and Muslim populations. And like in many parts of the world, they kind of basically split. Um, but that invasion kind of destabilized the island uh, for quite some time, for a couple of decades. And so consequently, what was a very active mining area um, suddenly basically became pretty much frozen in time. Um, and so it's very unusual to have an opportunity where you can pick up a lot of licenses in a previously active area um, and revisit them 45 years later. Um, without there having been really very much exploration at all. So it's a great territory for us. Uh, and in, in, the, in that, that uh, the, the license area we have is obviously extremely strongly mineralized. There's, there's mineraliza mineralization, evidence of mineralization everywhere. Um, and in fact, that area on the left, left right under that photograph is an old kind of Roman mine. Um, and here's a map of the island and, and all those little kind of crosses you see there are as a map of, of um, historical mines uh, or mine deposits. Uh, and there's something like 200 of them. Um, now, the thing to remember about uh, or understand about this historic mining in Cyprus is all those, uh, well, they're all VMS deposits, but they're all mined from surface expressions. They didn't have the technology as we do today to look under the ground. Um, and so you can see a very, very heavily mined area, but from surface. And as we all know about VMS, is VMS deposits come in clusters and they also come in stacks. And so the opportunity for us is to look under underground, um, you know, uh, from really sort of 50 to around 200 meters um, to look for buried VMS deposits of which there must be uh, a great many. Um, so here is the map of our, map of our license areas. 
So if you recall the previous slide and all those little um, crosses, they're in the kind of lime green area of that map, uh, which is the prospective belt. And so, you know, the, the, the prospective mining area is really very constrained. And <clears throat> to give you an idea of scale, that middle area, which is the green mountainous area, you can drive past that in about an hour. Um, and you can see from these uh, red and black shapes, <clears throat> which are our license areas, that we pretty much have bought all the license, all, all the good prospective licensing areas on the northern and southern flanks of those mountains. Um, and so we're the dominant player there. We're able to pick these license, uh, licenses up from the government, um, and uh, which is uh, pretty cheap. Uh, now, I know, uh, you know, every mining company likes to talk about their team and how they've got a great team, et cetera. But, you know, for a mining minnow like us, we're very small, we're really a micro cap company. Uh, we have a genuinely world class exploration team. Um, Dave Cliff, who's on our board, used to be the head of exploration Europe for Rio Tinto. Uh, obviously, an extremely experienced guy. Um, the individual who we hired as our COO um, about 12 months ago, Mike Parker, was at first quantum uh, for 20 years. Uh, Mike was key in two of their big copper discoveries, Lonsi and Frontier, um, and he actually named the Frontier uh, <coughs> a mining project. And he was country manager for First Quantum in DRC and then in Peru. Um, his circumstance was that after that long career, he wanted to return to the UK, but didn't really have much to do and, and kind of fancied the idea of Cyprus. Um, so we picked up an unusually senior guy to run our project. And Neil O'Brien, who some of you may know from Canada, um, he was one of the founders of London Mining. Um, he was head of new business development. He was Lucas London's kind of right-hand man. Um, and again, he also recently retired and has joined us as a technical consultant. So we have a fantastic team. Um, and their job is to hunt for um, buried VMS deposits. And uh, that photograph in the circle on the right um, shows you exactly one of those. Um, you can see that that kind of light area at the bottom is, is a VMS deposit um, with about, I guess, sort of 40, 50 meters of basalt on top of it. And this is actually one of the mines that was, was mined from a surface expression that used to stick out from the side of the hill. Um, and they mined it back until I think they couldn't mine further because of the cover. Um, but that is almost like a textbook um, illustration of a buried VMS deposit. And we think there are a lot of those, and that's what we're after. Uh, so we spent the whole of 2019 in target development um, and advancing our targets. And, you know, we've used with a team who are obviously all from, from, you know, big, big cap exploration companies, and they've applied that sort of program to our license areas. We started off with a remote sensing survey um, for the Sentinel-2 satellite. Um, geophysics, you can see a, um, a helicopter drone there. We've done a, a lot of uh, uh, soil sampling. We're big believers in uh, geochem um, and, uh, and also sort of mapping on the ground and uh, a considerable amount of archival work. Um, there's a lot of historical documents which we had to sift through. And we've kind of layered all those different um, work streams of exploration um to to develop our targets and where there's a lot of coincidence of data um then that leads us to our targets and this is probably the most important slide in the presentation this is our target list which we finalized last november um those targets are all in a a, a, a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer box uh there are about 30 of them and they're ranked and we we have a kind of priority list of 15 top ranked targets. So we have an awful lot of targets to get after. Um, we started, uh, as I mentioned, we just started drilling and <clears throat> during the rainy season uh, over the winter in Cyprus, we couldn't get a diamond drill in. So we decided to use a percussion drill, um, which as you may know, are usually used to drill water boreholes. Um, they don't give you an extreme, uh, uh, as an accurate, kind of assay uh, log that you'd get out of an RC drill, um, but they're very, very quick. Uh, you can drill a hole in a day, 
Um, it's very cheap to drill. Um, in euros, it costs about two and a half thousand euros to drill a hole, uh, all in with assays and, and sort of putting in some infrastructure, etc. It may cost about three to four thousand euros a hole to drill. So it's a lot quicker than drilling a diamond hole. And so we're using this to test all of our targets. And what it will tell you is if you're going through a VMS. So just before the lockdown hit, we managed to drill two targets and we got two out of two. Um, so two of those VMS targets you saw um, hit. And it was kind of slightly random as to which targets we went into because it was very wet. Um, and so we really kind of drilled the targets that we were able to get the drill truck into. Um, but we're very, very pleased. And we think that, uh, you know, that, that this result from the drilling is kind of somewhat proof of concept um, that our exploration methodology is good and that we think we'll get a very high hit rate out of the remaining targets. So this, is, this is one of the drill the percussion drill programs um, in section. Uh, we drilled four holes into it. Um, the first hole went into an intrusive um, cap rock uh, but the next hole hit a VMS deposit right under that cap. And we drilled another hole about 50 meters away and it hit it again. So we're really pleased um, with that result and we're really pleased with what that portends for the rest of our program. Um, you know, as regulars are pointing out, you know, the gold price has gone up and we went into this really as, as, a, as a copper play, but, but these VMS deposits are copper gold. And uh, we actually did a bit of diamond drilling when we first arrived at the end of 2008 and uh, started hitting some really good um, gold intersections. We had 29 meters of a gram a ton from surface, uh, which we actually hadn't expected. And since we did that drilling, the gold price has gone up 40%. Um, we started getting a lot of inquiries um, just in the last few weeks um, from investors saying, well, could you um, have a close look at the gold. So we conducted um, a, an evaluation of the gold potential. Um, uh, the view of the team is that this VMS camp is particularly gold rich and it's, it's a clean product as well, uh, which, which the smelters, a high demand from the smelters. And interestingly, we put out an announcement on that last Tuesday, uh, which was a fairly technical announcement and I didn't expect a lot of it, but the stock market here in London really caught hold of it. And the shares went up something like 200% on the day. We're the highest performing stock on the entire London Stock Exchange on that day with very big volumes. Uh, Neither to say that the share price kind of came off again the next day. Um, but the great thing for us is that Chesterfield resources as a stock is very much on play. Uh, we've attracted the attention of the market. Um, and when we get drilling again, we think that any good news um, will, will definitely um, gain traction. And just on that last point, I think that um, Chesterfield is a good play as a rebound from the COVID-19 lockdown, um, along with the rest of the Europe, um, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the first signs of lockdown are coming off. Um, Cyprus is unusual because it's an island uh, it didn't really get infected as much as, as the rest of Europe. They only had 12 deaths there. Um, the lockdown has been very successful. And we think that their lockdown is going to come off um, as quick, if not quicker, than, than the rest of Europe. Um, as I say, we have a, a strong kind of gold element in our copper play. Um, and the, <clears throat> you know, we're a micro cap, you know, the market cap, something like a, equivalent to 2 million. Canadian dollars, but combined with, um, you know, a, a, a big retail following and liquidity. And uh, we're going to get that percussion drill out as soon as the lockdown is over, hopefully in a couple of weeks time. Um, the drill we don't, you know, is literally just up the road on a truck. And so with a bit of luck, we'll be drilling uh, in a few weeks time. And I'd just to summarize Chesterfield, I'd say that that 2019 was a year of a lot of hard work and uh, development of targets, something like 30 targets. And we very much hope that 2020 will be a year of discovery. Thank you very much there, Martin. Another interesting presentation. Uh, I like Cyprus because I've actually been there and seen some of these things. So it's, uh, it always makes a lot more sense <laughs> when you've been on the ground and uh, kicked some rocks around. 
smashed a hammer. Uh, how do you find operating in Cyprus, knowing that it's it's already full of holes? How do you get around the historical workings? Do you have any danger there going after the deposits? Um, no, it's it's a pretty kind of remote area. Um, you know, all the population are down by the by the coast. Um, so, uh, but there's good infrastructure, good roads. Um, we managed to avoid the the big holes and drilling our little ones. So. Good stuff. And another thought in Cyprus, there's obviously, there's a lot of different um, known and mined historically deposit types. Uh, you've mentioned a lot of VMS targets there. Why have you focused on VMS? Yeah, well, well, I mean, you know, it, it is a VMS territory. Uh, actually, it's famous for VMS. People go there to study it. Um, but that is that is the geology. So as I mentioned, you know, the, is, as you say, it's been mined out on the surface, all those big holes. Um, but they're for sure they're going to be a lot of buried VMS targets. And you know, interestingly, there's been very, very little exploration in Cyprus in the last 45 years. And I think that really is our opportunity is to apply new technology, techniques, knowledge um, to look on the ground. Yeah, I think most of the exploration has been done by uni field trips. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you happen to stumble over some chalcopyrite somewhere. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, just a reminder to um, John and Claudia there, there's a few questions in the q and I don't know if you, uh, if you wouldn't mind answering those. If you just click type answer, uh, or we can, we can come to them in person later if you prefer. We're gonna move on to Cole Evans now from Crystal Lake. Cole, can you hear me? Me. Hey, Cole, how you doing today? Good, thanks, Liam, thanks for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome. Welcome to the Slovakian bunker. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Cole's going to tell us a bit about, yep, yep, go ahead, take it away. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to change the pace a little bit here, because maybe I, I might have read into the title too literally and make a case for copper. So that was my original thing was make a case for copper. But then I'm going to tie it into how that has significant importance, not only for Crystal Lake and the Newmont Lake project, but for, for British Columbia in general and, and where we are and up in the Golden Triangle, if that works for everybody. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll transition to a slideshow that I pulled up here in a few minutes, but I'll just uh, start with with kind of a discussion. And I, I think Rick Rule, I, I went and saw one of his talks last fall in, in San Francisco, and it, it's kind of touching on this if versus when question I think he speaks to really well. And where I think copper is, is, is it if or is it when? Um, in arguing the case for it's very much when. Uh, when, when we look at copper, everyone knows the importance of copper, you know, from wires to contraceptives, it's in, it's in everything, right? And um, it's, it's very much like the, the oil to the metal sort of thing. Um, and it's pretty well known in particular, a number of years ago, a really good article came out talking about the copper squeeze and what's going on in, in, in John Black had, had a, a good graph in his presentation that brought it up in the beginning about how we have this demand side increasing but our supply side is, is starting to, I don't want to say fall, it's falling through the floor, but it's, it's very much starting that. And what's going on, so sorry, touching a little bit more on the demand side of that before I get into the supply where I really want to, want to talk about is we've said before, um, and Andrew mentioned this, China, China is for, about 49%, 50% of the world's copper uh, consumption. They are not slowing down. Um, no matter what, in my, in my opinion, they're, they're, they're pushing forward. Um, but what's going on with the supply? And I, and I think that's a, a gap that not enough people talk about. And um, I'll relate Chile much like the, um, maybe this is a bad analogy, but the Saudi Arabia uh, of, of copper, so to speak, and Cordeco or whatever, um, uh, Cordelco, sorry. But, um, so what, what's it look like when we're talking about our major copper deposits in the world? And tying into from a technical, my background in, in, in geology, exploration geology is what made Latin America so successful? Um, number one being obviously where it is if we're talking about the greater ring of fire, but um, it's, a, it's a process called super gene enrichment that I'm sure, I know you have a, a, a quite a technical following that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, and, and for those who aren't, People always think I'm funny, but I love I love I love drawing on a whiteboard to explain to people. And all all super gene enrichment is is what what makes these deposits so rich. Why was Chile the Saudi Arabia of copper? And that's because you have these big porphyry systems, as we know, that are coming up to surface. But when we talk about the Atacama and just the the desert and and, and what's going on in Chile, you have 
the water table at a very low level relative to, I won't get into all the zones, but let's just say, uh, everyone can see my, my little drawing here. Um, let's just say that's, that's the water table here, right? And so we have these big systems that have come up in space. And what happens is over, over a period of time, you know, rain falls, meteoric waters, all these things. And you have this big gap in the surface where these mineral deposits are, are um, outcropping coming down to this water table. Why is that so important? It's in this oxidizing environment, right? We talk of particularly with copper deposits, the importance of oxide versus sulfide, um, this and that. And it creates a leaching process. And I won't get into the exact geochemistry, but it essentially transports all this copper into a very high grade enrichment blanket, which for those of you that are familiar with, with Latin America is, is um, one of the reasons why these deposits are so rich and such high grade. And if we look at it from a geometrical perspective, tying in the, the, the mining engineering to it, this is a perfect style for deposit because we have our highest grade near surface Right, our quickest payback, and then they'll continue to mine out the hypogene um, as it goes. Well, these deposits are disappearing. Um, it, that's, that's well known. And in what's going on in the market space, oh, sorry, <laughs> what's going on in the market space that further suggests that, you know, a big indicator to me that I saw last year in particular was look at Rio Tinto, right? One of the world's largest copper producers. And they spent 1.5 billion for a six year mine life increase at Bingham Canyon. For those, most of you are probably familiar with Bingham Canyon, um, just outside of Salt Lake City, but it produces 1% of the world's um, copper, I believe, um, maybe somewhere in the four to 6% range of the US's uh, copper or copper production, but the, or sorry, yes, copper so demand. Um, what's, if, if you look at the numbers, Rio took over that project in 1989. And, it, and since then, they've spent about $5 billion in improvements, mine life um, extensions, environmental, things like that. And if you look and work out the numbers, a $1.5 billion spend for an increase of a six-year mine life, it's, it's a perfect case study as to you're spending more money to mine lower grades at, at deeper depths. And it, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. It's not a sustainable practice. So that, that kind of ties in a, a bit on the supply side and, and where I think you're going to see pressure and where the copper space is really going to increase. And again, relating back to people who are much smarter than myself, Mark Bristol made a very interesting comment in January, 2020, um, or, and, and just paraphrasing, he mentioned how copper, within the next 10 years will be the most, or one of the most strategic commodities on the planet. And any serious gold producer, if they're not already, will be a copper producer or, 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 or contender in the copper space. And it was touching uh, largely on, you know, Barrick's potential interest in, in, um, in Freeport's piece of Grasberg. So moving into that, where do we see you know, I could, I, I could go on and on. And the last particular thing I'll bring up only because, you know, obviously the, an unfortunate thing of, of this pandemic going on, but perhaps what people aren't seeing in the news as much still is the political instability in Chile, right? Our Saudi Arabia of copper. And, you know, I can't comment on whether or not that will have effect on the supply side, but it surely probably won't help it. Uh, and, and that's where I believe it, we, we now sit in, in an economy and in a world where British Columbia and Canada in general has um, a, a serious, serious chance of becoming a uh, world copper contender. And this ties into, I'm, now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna kind of share with you a bit of my thoughts here. Let me see if I can get this uh, screen share in as, as we go. Can everyone see, see my other screen there? Thumbs up, Liam, is it? Still waiting for it to load. Um, can anybody else see it? Is it just me? Oh. There we go, that's up now. Cheers, Colt. There we go. Everyone was frozen there for a second. And 
why I want to show this image. Okay, for, for people that don't know where I am, let me zoom out a little bit first. And I'll just circle it here. Of course, this is not showing that well on live screen. So here we are in British Columbia, Western Canada, right? And I'm going to zoom into this circle. And why? Because this satellite image, and for those who know me, I'm a little eccentric, but I love satellite imagery. Um, and we can, we can tell a lot just by looking at this. In particular, you'll see these pits, right? So there's Afton, there's New Gold. It used to be Tech who mined Afton, New Gold's New Afton. Here's Ajax, many people familiar in the area would, would know about. We have Craigmont down here. Um, a little bit for, for Kodiak Copper, their project would be sitting down that way towards Copper Mountain. And then this is the Highland Valley complex in here. Now, people know it as Highland Valley. It's really um, four mines between producers and past producers um, that feed a, a, feed a super mill more or less. But within this area, you have a milling capacity of 220,000 tons for 24 hours, right? This is, this is definitely the most important copper producing jurisdiction in Canada. By 2029, all these resources will be completely exhausted. That's in nine years. Um, as we know, the, the lag time from discovery to production, nine years does not fit the average. You know, an average would be, be much more along the lines of 20 some odd years. So it plays in what do we have locally in British Columbia and just referring into what's right now our most important copper producing jurisdiction, the squeeze is there. And while it might not be seen, I think there's a reason why, and I'll relate it back to Rio, who made statements earlier this year, um, or sorry, that might have been last year at AMEBC, about all these, um, their interest for copper projects in British Columbia. And people in the industry are well aware that the majors are now starting to flood in, and they're looking for good projects in British Columbia that are copper focused. A couple other examples, of course, would be Newcrest up at uh, Red Chris in the Golden Triangle, and then Newmont. Again, your gold producers, now I'm, I'm talking about alkalic porphyries or copper and gold importance, but um, Newmont coming in and buying 50% of the Lower Creek, 275 million. And this is where we tie into um, to our project itself. And particularly what's going on with technology and what's going on with the deposits themselves that's starting to see this flood of big money into the copper and copper gold space. We really, in particularly in British Columbia, they're, it's, it's difficult to separate those two stories because when we, especially when we talk about alkalic porphyry systems, they're rich in both copper and gold. So like I said, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna tie it over to actually a presentation for your more technical folk by our, uh, everyone see that here? I, I'm, I'm gonna whiz through a bit of this so I can stick to our, our timeline here, Liam, but um, this, this is something, so my, sorry, I did a poor introduction of myself. For those who don't know me, I'm, I recently became the CEO of Crystal Lake Mining about four years ago, or four months ago, sorry, not four years ago, uh, four months ago. And um, I also own a, own a private um, company called HEG. It started out as a, an exploration services company and now uh, wears, wears a number of hats. But um, this was a presentation that two of our geologists put together, one of which is um, I would consider world-class. He's a very humble guy. He won't tell you this, but what I would consider world-class knowledge in the copper space. He was the, um, he was the senior project geo at Highland Valley, of course, Canada's largest copper mine for a number of years. So we're very, we're very in tune with copper um, forward looking statements. I'm going to skip through all this here, like we said, for the sake of time. Um, just and uh, this just is to going... jump in, Cole, sorry. Um, yep. I, can't, I can't see the screen there. Can anybody else see that? If Claudia nope. can't either. I, you might need to uh, unshare the screen. So at the top, if you go to view options and unshare. Okay. And then reshare the, the presentation. Let's try. Um, it is a very pretty satellite image. But, uh, <laughs> I 
There we go. And then if you, uh, oh, I don't know if you can try and uh, share the screen again there, Cole. How's that, Liam? There we go. Now I can see that perfectly. Yeah, thank you for that. Cheers. No problem. And is it uh, it's changing there for you? Excellent. Sorry about that, everybody. I'm flying too quickly. So this is this is a bit on porphyry deposits. We won't get into that. At um, this is the Newmont Lake project. So this is particularly to Crystal Lake, and what's important and why. Um, you know, we decided to get involved in, um, in particularly with, with a lot of changes that, that people are already seeing with the company from a corporate perspective. Um, and this, this is just a generalized map of the golden triangle we see in here. Hopefully people can see my cursor. Um, and Newmont Lake is a 550 square kilometer right in the heart of the golden triangle. I mean, we're surrounded, fortunately, by um, what, what would be defined as world-class uh, copper projects, copper and gold projects. I already mentioned before, um, just starting with the north, we have Red Crisp, of course, producing mine wind production uh, about four or five years ago. 70% uh, of that was just bought out last year. I started just um, within the last couple of years by uh, Newcrest out of Australia. Uh, also, people are, would be familiar up there as well with your um, saddle, GT Gold. Absolutely, that team's done an incredible job in the last few years in that discovery. Moving further in, we have Shaft Creek, of course, Galore Creek, another world-class alkalic porphyry system. Um, just within the last couple of years, Newmont bought 50% of that project for 275 million. And keep in mind, when I say project, this is not a producing mine, this is just, just a deposit. Then we have our big slab, Newmont Lake in the middle, and we keep moving down through KSM. Of course, one of the largest undeveloped copper gold projects, projects in the world. And as people know, Bruce Jack, SK, that's getting more into our, into our gold space. Newmont Lake itself, we have it divided into three major, um, what we call systems, you know, keep, keep, um, uh, keep in touch for, for some updates that could be coming on that. And like I said, we're not just a copper story. I'm gonna talk about the copper, but our, our predominant focus will actually be in the high grade gold with copper space. Um, some of the drill results we had this year was 44 meters, four grams gold, four grams silver with 0.29% copper. So again, very much it is a copper and gold story uh, put together. But this is talking about, I'm just going to, like I said, flip through here because I want to talk specifically about a technology that uh, we use at a, at a, to a very big level um, called hyperspectroscopy. And going back to that bigger copper story about these 21st century deposits, what is going to find a big copper system today? Um, and for those who aren't familiar with, with hyperspectroscopy, think of it as, um, you know, our eyes see a certain wavelength of light. Hyperspec is, is, eyes that are seeing different wavelengths that the, that the geologist cannot see. It's, it's creating, um, particularly in the shortwave infrared and visible near infrared spectrums, that's what we focus on. Uh, and it all starts with a detailed mapping on surface. So this is 72, this is part of our greater Burgundy 72 trend. Um, we believe at this point is at least a 2.3 kilometer alkalic porphyry system um, that we first, we're the first people to ever diamond drill it. Uh, this year, and I'll, I'll get into some of the uh, some of the results that we're already starting to get, and how importantly how we do it, and how this is important for the copper story. Um, so when we when we look at hyperspectroscopy, to to put it in a simple form, um, for for non technical people, think about it much like uh, if I was cooking in the kitchen, and I and I nick my hand on the side of my um, of boiling a pot of boiling water, it would hurt. I'd get a little burn on my finger, but I'd, I'd be okay. Um, now compare that to, you know, um, third degree burns from a, you know, God forbid someone's caught in a, in a large fire or something, right? There's varying degrees is what I'm getting at. Um, but they're not, rocks see the same thing. This alteration that we talked about, think of it much like that burning. And not all this 
not all this burning is equal. We can see light amounts of burning and heavy amounts of burning, depending on the temperature and fluids that we're dealing with. We want big systems. We want hot, hydrous, massive systems. That's, that's, we're looking for elephants. That's our focus. So this alteration that previously our human, and still, obviously, it is still this data human eye cannot see, but we now have the technology that can see that. And this is critical. And you'll see a lot of majors doing it. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud of our team. I, I think we're probably one of the only juniors in the space using this technology to, to an effective level. And here's a case study of it, of where we took uh, just a three-hole fan system, and we have these massive alteration areas on surface. And then we focus it in on so broad drilling where people, again, familiar with, with copper porphyries, will see these broad philic or propylitic alteration assemblages. And we're trying to get to that potassium center, that hot, you know, where is the fire? That's what this does. So here in this section, you can see it was a, a perfect example of this. Think of the green as cooler, you know, the, uh, first degree burns. And where we're getting into our pink, these are our third degree burns. Um, and what, what, were the, what were the results of that as we put this together? Okay, our first ever alkalic porphyry intercept. We believe we just nicked the side of it. Again, largely in use of this hyperspectroscopy. Uh, that was 56 meters of 0.45% copper, 0.33 gold, 3.44 silver. And touching into the depths of where we're seeing this start at, we're still very shallow uh, for a porphyry system. Uh, within that, we can see where bornite, for your, for your technical people, where, where we're seeing our uh, alteration really kick in. So within there, uh, about 22 meters of 0.89% copper, 0.71 gold, 6.65 grams silver. Clean, clean mineralogy, clean geochemistry. Uh, for a first pass, three holes on, on a target that's never been drilled before, we're, we're quite happy with, we were quite happy with these results when we saw them come out um, and, and are confident in our ability to, um, to push those forward. And what's that look like on a bigger scale? So we do this with drill holes, but we also do it on surface as well and map it out. And where are all these hot spots? And as you can see from, oh, sorry, from the maps and these textures, to get the kind of alteration and mineralization we're seeing, it can't be an isolated event. Um, and you know, I, I, I'll, I'll touch into a, a Claudia's presentation with, with uh, Kodiak Copper, uh, you know, a good project in, in their thinking of, you have all this, you have all these holes historically, you know, what in, we didn't have the technology historically to understand these systems from a big level and what they really mean, but now we do. It's the same kind of story, um, just with ours, it's, it's very much that blue sky potential and nobody's touched this before. Um, and you can see the textures and the mineralization we have in here. Our, our first pass of it is, is, is bringing some fairly, what we feel extraordinary uh, results. Another one that probably won't be on here is um, touching on some of our channel sampling work um, where and I have the, the rocks here in front of me. Um, we're, we're seeing breaches, again, on surface, never been drilled before. Our team channeled a continuous 22 meters of 2% copper, 2.27 grams gold, 34 grams silver, and 4.7% zinc. This is right on surface. And, and the re people ask, well, why do these exist? Why has no one touched them? And it's largely in that ice retreat story and a story I tell a lot of people that I didn't really believe until the last 18 months when we were in an area of the Golden Triangle where I saw it um, to, to a large degree and, and we now since go back and track satellite imagery and, and ortho photos and we are actually able to map uh, the scale of this ice retreat is, is to the kilometers in scale. So we're, we're fortunate where we're in the heart of one of the um, most well-endowed mineral districts of the world. And we're finding, you know, um, I, I don't like to use the term world-class from an exploration project, because I think that's, that's overreaching, but grades that are in line, um, or if not better than, than some of the world-class projects which surround us on, on all sides. So it, it's, it's really exciting from the, the copper space and with 
uh, these big companies moving in, you know, I'll touch on, on Newcrest as my last point on the importance of block caving and getting into why British Columbia, I think, will be successful with this new technology and these new mining methods is, like I talked about before, um, with, with the super gene enriched deposits of Latin America, we are mining from the top, our highest, best grades, and then coming down into our hypogene. Well, what's going on now with block caving? It's the exact opposite. These deposits, we don't have, our, we don't have the fortunate um, uh, geo, you know, geomorphological processes, whatever uh, you want to call them, geochemical processes that make these super gene enrichment blankets. Our um, highest grade is, you know, flip them upside down, right, in these potassic centers. Well, the new way of mining is not from the top down, it's from the bottom up in these block caving and coming from underneath. So I think with the, um, with, with companies like Newcrest, Rio Tinto, and, and there's others coming into British Columbia, particularly in the copper space, it's gonna be changing for the province and in and, um, and a serious industry change that, that'll be to the benefit of all of Canada. That's cool, Cole. Can I push you for a, a quick uh, one sentence summary of uh, Crystal Lake and your presentation? Just, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, again, Leah, my apologies for, for <laughs> a little more of a technical presentation, but yeah, so Crystal Lake, like I said itself, um, we're our dominant focus with 550 square kilometers. I'm going to rip back to my map here. Uh, in the heart of the Golden Triangle, uh, we've got three working on a fourth major um, systems, as we call it. You know, this is a high grade nickel, we have high grade gold, high grade copper. Um, everything. The, uh, the main thing will be focused in the near term, like I said, is very much on that gold story. We do have a historic gold resource in this area we call the Newmont Lake Gold Corridor. That was drilled in the 1980s, small resource, um, quarter million ounces of gold, uh, about 7 million pounds of copper, about another 300,000 ounces of silver. But the important things on that is um, there is, so it, here, here's where it stands out for us. That was on 18,000 meters of drilling, of which only 3,200 meters was assay. Um, this was calculated at $475 an ounce gold. It was calculated at cutoff grades that are higher than what is now the world's average mining grade for if we were looking at worldwide. Or, so the cutoff grade on those calculations was two grams per ton gold. Of course, if we're looking at North American and Australian um, Pro, uh, development projects, your average grade is 1.46 grams per ton gold. Uh, and, and it's seen since the 80s, if you can see in this image, um, just working out toward on that southeastern end, you've had about 2 billion uh, infrastructure improvements right in the immediate area. We now literally have the intake to um, part of an over 250 megawatt power plant system touching our property. Um, when this was drilled in the 1980s, you were 75 kilometers from the nearest road and a couple hundred kilometers from the nearest power plant. The road and the power plant are now literally touching our property. So the mineral economics have... Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in on you again. That was a very long yeah. sentence. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> nice one. So thank you very much, Cole, for presenting. Um, for overrunning, you're going to get the meanest questions, I think. Uh, so I was expecting that's, that. That's yeah, that's going to be your uh, your punishment there. Um, yeah. Andrew, Andrew, are you still about still around there? Yeah, I love the Newmont Lake project. There's a lot going on there. I think uh, we could probably sit for like two or three hours and talk about it. <laughs> so I think uh, Sam, who's our web admin, is going to throw up something new for our room now. We're going to try and poll you with some questions. Um, there we go. So if you'd like to select your answer on screen now, then we'll all have something to talk about. <laughs> While we're doing that, I've got a question probably for Claudia. Let's start with uh, start with yourself. What are the um, sort of entry and exit gates for copper price at the moment? Looking at sort of 2008 when copper was 70 cents a kilogram up to 2011, two dollars a kilogram. What are the you know what are the points where we say this is amazing or this can't happen anymore for you? 
A very good question. If you look at the copper price, it had over the last year, 2019, a difficult time with the US-China trade war and was depressed. And then started a nice rally towards the end of the year up to $2.80 or almost nudging towards the $3 per pound mark. And then, of course, came Corona. And we are now at the 230, 240 levels. And I believe that the current um, copper price levels are not sustainable. We are around the 90th cost curve percentile. And his, his, in history, that has always provided a very clear bottom. At this time, I think 10, 15% of all mines are um, burning cash and are losing money. So uh, we will see, I am sure, a recovery from those levels. And looking into the future, the um, long-term fundamentals, they stay intact. And most commentators see the incentive price needed to get new projects going to fill that demand that um, will come from all the green technologies, they see that incentive price north of $3. And I think that's the, the level of prices that will be needed to encourage new supply. And eventually we'll, we'll get there. And if history is a guide, after 2008, nine, when all copper prices, all commodity prices were depressed and supply got cut, that set up or set the stage for a great rally and, and very high commodity prices in 2010 and 11. And I am sure we'll also see a recovery rally this time. Thank you very much. So the answers are in here. So copper has won, uh, unsurprisingly in this room, <laughs> uh, in a copper-based ceremony. Um, Sam, if you want to pop up the next question, we're going to go to Martin. So Martin, you're operating in a very different jurisdiction to Peru or Canada uh, in terms of public knowledge. Um, how do you find going to Canadians uh, and discussing Cyprus or going to America? We um, <clears throat> say most of our founding group of investors are from Toronto and Vancouver. Um, so, you know, they're, they're kind of notable individuals um, you know, sort of senior investors, I'd say, personal investors in, in the sector. And uh, Neil O'Brien, who I was mentioning, um, the ex-London guy who is our chief technical consultant, is from Toronto. So, uh, you know, we go to PDAC as well. We talk to a lot of people. Um, I think the, the London um, stock market is not a market that necessarily a lot of Canadians invest in. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got a lot of liquidity in our stock. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a global economy and um, I think it's something that Canadians should be interested in. Thank you very much, Martin. So the uh, results are in again. Uh, with global hydrocarbons struggling, have you looked at alternative energy investments? And the answer seems to be fairly positive about uh, green and clean energy. On that note, let's move on to John. John, if you're there and you can hear me. Can you hear me there, John? Yes, I can. Wonderful. So the question is concerning green energy in Peru. What are the main energy sources you'd be looking at using uh, for production there? Uh, the, the most logical one in, in Peru is Peru is a, a fairly mountainous country with the whole eastern side dropping off into the Amazon. So there's quite a bit of rainfall up above. And right now, there are several very large hydro uh, projects. There's relatively cheap power costs for existing mines um, due to that hydropower. And then in the, in the southern part of the country, there are some very extensive gas fields called the Camasea gas fields. And those have been discovered and drilled out. And there's there, over the last decade or so, there's been a big debate about whether they export that gas or whether they keep it in country to, to allow development in country. And it, it, it's, it's resulted in that if you wanted to tap into those type of sources, it'd be very welcome politically, locally, that you're using uh, either gas or hydropower that's that's abundant in the, in the country to use. So um, we're not seeing the wind or solar projects that you see in, in Chile coming in yet, but it's, it's larger because the, the gas and the hydro is there to, to provide the benefit. Great stuff. Thank you very much for, for responding there. And then uh, the third question, uh, do you still consider offtake agreements to be secure? Uh, the results are in for that one. And the answer seems to be a fairly confident no. Um, 
Um, I think we'll go to, I would normally go to Andrew on that because the China is obviously an important player there, but uh, I think we may have lost Andrew's connection. So, Cole, I don't know if you want to uh, give us a single sentence answer. <laughs> uh, what, what do you think about global offtake agreements? Do you think there's still something we can gamble on and bet on? I'd, I'd tend to agree with the audience on the confident no. And, and yeah. you knowing me, you want to keep me to a, to a one sentence. <laughs> Great stuff. So there should be another poll on the screen coming up now. Question four, which precious material do you think will perform best in the next 12 months? So when this one comes in, we're going to come back to Claudia. <laughs> I think we know what this answer is going to be already. <laughs> mm -hmm. With copper not being on the board and this being a copper room. So Claudia, the answers are in as far as I can see. That's uh, everybody in the room has voted pretty much. And it's 86% in favor of gold. <laughs> uh, I think that's fairly predictable. Nobody voted for diamonds. Uh, I'm happy to see, because I would have had to raise that and, and pick, pick somebody out on it. What are your thoughts on gold over the next, uh, next 12 months? I think if you look around the various market commentators, there's one thing um, that everybody pretty much agrees on. And that is that gold is in for um, a rally and that, that the fundamentals are very much in favor of gold, whether that's debt levels that will be substantially increased um, with all the stimulus. And yeah, I think um, I would very much agree with that. And I'd be surprised not to see strong gold prices over the, the next couple of months. Yeah, definitely in the short term. Uh, pretty much all of the gold projects that I've put money into have, have done well. So um, everything else seems to be quite mixed. So question five is now on the screen. Uh, and this is one that I think Martin can, uh, can talk about. We've talked about the differences in Canada, London, in terms of trading. Which exchange do you think is going to perform best for miners in the next 12 months, Martin? Ooh, that's a difficult question. Um, I mean, you know, I also invest... Um, and I'd say, you know, personally, you know, being in London, I'm fairly agnostic between, um, you know, the, the big the big markets, Australia, TS, you know, ASX, TSX, LSE. Um, you know, I think they've all got good junior miners on them. Um, and I think, I suppose, probably more sector, sector specific, obviously, the gold miners are, are in vogue at the moment. Um, but as I say, I think copper's going to come back because uh, I agree with Claudia, you know, copper's on the floor. But I think there are a lot of mega trends coming through that's going to uh, draw attention to copper. So I'd rather than which exchange I'd go for which commodity. Yeah. Interesting thoughts. Well, the results uh, from the room suggest Toronto. Um, I think it's a fairly Canada heavy room as well. So we've got uh, the, the gold copper bias and the Canadian bias creeping in there <laughs> quite clearly. Uh, if we move on to the next question, I'm going to ask a question again for you, Martin, from, uh, from Charlie, who you know. Uh, what gives a small high-grade project in Cyprus? Um, sorry, uh, what does a small high-grade project in Cyprus have over a larger-grade project in South America? Ooh, thanks for the question, Charlie. Um, I don't think it's not where it is, but I, I think you know we, as a as a group, we went into a small, um, you know, almost micro-cap company because we think that's where the leverage is. So, obviously, if you're going into a bigger company and they make discoveries, it's probably not going to go up as much. Whereas a small, a small cap company like us, we think we've got the potential to, you know, go up hopefully several times. Interesting, yeah. And then we've got a question here for for John uh, from Warren Pratt, who I, I think is up in Scotland at the moment. Um, a very good mapping geologist. He asks, is there room for tailings? Uh, is there room enough for tailings for such an enormous open pit project? Hi, Warren, John here. Um, yeah, good, great question on this. Um, there, there is room, but it, it, you've touched on probably one of the biggest challenges for us on the project in terms of scaling it properly. When we have as much mineralization as already defined between what we have and the neighbors have, it, it, um, it begs the question of, of putting in a very large operation, which then you need to have the footprint. So the mineral, the mineral um, where the deposit's located is secured, 
but securing the footprint for tailings and other infrastructure we need around it are, are one of the big challenges. So physically, yes, the challenge is really, and it, it, it means that we need to acquire additional surface lands around the area. And we need to be very good about how we conduct our social programs so that the communities around the area are comfortable with what we're doing. Um, there are also some considerations on this in terms of, of with the, the recent incidents we've seen in Brazil and elsewhere on tailings, um, probably making, at least considering more of a move towards dry stack. And dry stack adds cost, but it actually gives us more flexibility on where you put it. Uh, and it, you have more options in where you put it. You're not having to target certain areas, which tend to be valleys, which are often times where agriculture is. So, so I, I think you might see uh, mines of the future moving more in that direction in the Andes. Cheers, yeah, interesting. So we have the results of this surprise question. Uh, which company do you think are most likely to build a mine based on today's presentations? So we've actually got a complete draw between Kodiak and Regulus here, uh, which is interesting to see. I don't know if that's a, a split between Canada and non-Canada again, or, <laughs> um, but there, cheers for voting. We've got one last question, I believe. Very oh. similar vein. <laughs> oh, no. To put you all on the spot, who do you think gave the best presentation today? I think uh, James Stratford's right there. It's definitely a copper gold heavy room. <laughs> while, uh, while you're voting on the best presentation there, uh, there's a question from Fred for Cole. <laughs> I don't know if you've got a sentence for Fred. Um, when are your drill results due out from last year? <laughs> this is the evil question. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, no. Hi, Fred. Um, sorry, let me just pull so I see myself here. Yeah, no, so that's so a good question. We've released... Um, obviously a big portion of the work that was done in 2019. Um, one of the important things of myself coming in as a CEO of Crystal Lake uh, was very much in, in, um, in, from, a, from a corporate perspective. And um, so that's, that's, that's building our team and in, in ensuring we have all the right people in place to bring this project to the level that, that we believe it is at from a technical perspective and where it needs to go. Uh, and second, secondly, a, a large part of it too is um, the sheer amount of work that was done in, in tying it into one um, product, not, not something that's half finished. Uh, just as an example, be, uh, and lots of the IP geophysics uh, that we did, we, we did a, a fairly extensive IP program this year, of which we've put out um, lots of the results from that. But it's the amount of data we inherited that was not um, even... So, so when we talk about IP, there's the difference between pseudo sections and inversions, um, what we'd call finished products. And so it's tying that all together. And we have years worth of this data that was never inverted and never, never looked at. So it's been a very big uh, job putting that all together into one package, particularly in 3D space. And, and to be quite frank with you, the uh, COVID situation hasn't helped either. Uh, unfortunately, we had to shut down our office for for about three weeks or so, we're back in here now, as of um, as of last week. Um, so, but things things are more; they're very much plugging away. There's there's eight geologists in the next room, uh, right over beside me, crunching things. Through. Good stuff. We're looking forward to some news then. So, in uh, yeah, fingers crossed, it's uh, it's soon. <laughs> Um, so the result of that last question there, who gave the best presentation? Again, it's a tie between Regulus and Kodiak, almost with Regulus one vote ahead at the last second there. <laughs> so uh, somebody's just clicked on the screen as we were announcing. Cheers. Okay, and then the final question, if you'd like to get your answers in for that while I say a quick thank you to John, Claudia, Martin, Cole and Andrew, and especially to Sam, who's behind the scenes there beavering away and trying to make everything technical look good. <laughs> uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week, guys. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Liam. Great. Cheers. Hey, Liam. Thanks. Cheers. There we go. Regardless of the answer, I'm hoping everybody returns anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. I'm going to log off now. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Martin. Cheers, Cole. Cheers, Cheers John. Cheers.